Hi, boys and girls. Welcome back. Today we're reading I Descent. It's the story of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Making Her Mark. It's by Debbie Levy and illustrated by Elizabeth Bad Baddeley. But we're going to start with our riddle. What does a judge put in her drink? Think about it. Let's go. I Descent, Ruth Bader Ginsburg Makes Her Mark. Written by Debbie Levy. Illustrated by Is Elizabeth Baddeley. Oh, I'm saying that right. You could say Ruth Bader Ginsburg life has been one disagreement after another. Disagreement with creaky old ideas, with unfairness, with inequality. Ruth has disagreed, disappeared, and differed. She has objected, she has resisted, she has dissented. Disagreeable, no, determined, yes. This is how Ruth Bader Ginsburg changed her life and ours. In 1940, little Ruth's neighborhood was vibrant with immigrants, people from Italy, Ireland, England, Poland, and Germany, Jews from Russia like Jew Ruth's father. Nathan Bader, people from future cultures, from different cultures with different holidays, foods, and traditions. But all of these families in Brooklyn, New York, and in all the families everywhere, the thing was the same. Everything was the same. Boys were expected to grow up and go out in the world and do big things. Girls, girls were expected to find husbands. Ruth's mother disagreed. Celia Amster Bader thought that girls should also have the chance to make their mark on the world. So she took Ruth to the library. On the shelves were stories of girls and women who did big things. Ruth read about Nancy Drew, girl detective. She discovered Amelia Earhart, daring aviator. She learned of Athena, the goddess of Greek myths. Here were independent girls and women taking charge. Ruth read her way into this world. Around her, the sweet scent of books blended with savory aromas from the Chinese restaurant downstairs. Delicious. A girl could be anything. Sometimes Ruth and her parents took trips out of the crowded city, and they drove past a hotel in Pennsylvania. Ruth saw a sign, no dogs or Jews allowed. This is how it was in those days. Hotels, restaurants, even entire neighborhoods announcing no Jews, no color, no Mexicans, whites only. Ruth and her family were Jewish. There was prejudice, pure and simple. Now it was Ruth's turn to disagree. She disagreed by never forgetting how it felt to read such words. She never forgot the sting of prejudice. In elementary school, Ruth was excellent in some classes and less excellent in others. Her favorites were English history and gym, and those she did well, but there was handwriting. Ruth was left-handed. Back then, teachers told left-handers they should try to write with their right hands. Ruth's right-handed penmanship was so bad, she earned a D in her penmanship test. She cried. Then she protested. Ruth protested by writing with her left hand from that day forward, and it turned out she had quite nice handwriting. Ruth also had a little problem with sewing and cooking. These were her least favorite classes, but girls had to take them. Boys took shop. They were, worked with saws and other tools. She wanted to take shop. She wanted to handle a saw. She didn't get what she wanted. It may have been unfair to girls and to boys, but Ruth was learning that sometimes life was like that. Ruth loved music. She especially loved opera. In music class, she lifted up her voice and song. Then it came that this time it was Ruth's music teacher who objected gently. Ruth simply could not carry a tune. The teacher asked Ruth not to sing out loud in chorus. Ruth kept on singing in the shower in her dreams. She continued to adore opera too. By the time Ruth was in high school, friends and teachers knew her as an outstanding student, baton twirler, cello player, newspaper editor. 
As graduation approached, Ruth was chosen to make a speech at the ceremony, but she had been keeping a big secret. Her mother was terribly sick. The day before her graduation, Celia Bader died. There was no agree agreeing with this. There was no disagreeing. This simply was... Ruth did not go to her graduation. She did not give her speech. Still, Ruth knew what her mother wanted. Three months later, she left home to attend college. Not many girls went to college in the 1950s. Ruth made friends, but she also met girls who excluded Jews from their clubs. She also met boys who thought that girls should be looking for husbands. And then she met Martin Gittensburg. Martin was tall and funny. Ruth was small and serious. Marty can make her laugh. They fell in love and hatched a plan. After college, they would go to law school. Both of them, lawyers, Ruth had learned, could fight unfairness and prejudice in our courts. People thought it was a fine idea for Marty to attend law school. They didn't think Ruth should go. A lady lawyer? People disapproved. Ruth disapproved right back. So did Marty. And they got married. They went to law school. And they had a baby, Jane. Ruth's law school had a total of nine women and 500 men. She studied mightily and tied for the first place of the class. And yet, at graduation time, no one would hire a brilliant new lawyer. Why not? She was a woman. Men didn't want to work with a woman. She was a mother. Men thought a mother wouldn't pay attention to work. She was Jewish. Many people were still prejudiced. Three strikes against her, but Ruth was not out. She resisted and persisted. Finally, a judge hired her, and she worked like mad for him. After that, one law school hired her, then another. Ruth became one of the few female law professors in the whole country, and she did it with a new baby at home, James. Ruth had disagreed and worked her way into being a lawyer or professor, but around her, other women were excluded from jobs. When they did get jobs, they earned less than men. They were kept out of important roles in court and government. To make matters worse, the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in land, approved of all this. As one Supreme Court, con the, as one Supreme court justice had written years before, the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female evidently unfits it for many of occupations of civil life. In other words, women and girls were too shy and too weak to do big things in the world. Another Supreme Court opinion declared, women have always been dependent upon man. Ruth really disagreed with this. So Ruth went to court to fight for equal treatment of women. The most important cases went to the Supreme Court. The first time she appeared there, Ruth was so nervous, she feared she might be sick. But standing before the nine Supreme Court justices, Ruth imagined them as her students. She, Professor Ginsburg, needed to teach these students, who were all men, why a person's choices shouldn't be limited just because she was born a girl. Ruth wasn't only fighting for women. When women were excluded from her work, work world, men were excluded from home life. Why shouldn't a father stay home to care for his children and cook meals? Why shouldn't his wife run a business? There were fresh ideas in the 1970s. Ruth did not win every case, but she won enough. With each victory, women and men and girls and boys enjoyed a little more equality. Sometimes Ruth and Marty's children received confused looks when they said their mother argued cases in the Supreme Court and their father made the family's dinners. People found this strange. Ruth, Marty, Jane, and James did not concur. They kept on being the type of family they wanted to be, and dinners at the Ginsburg home were delicious, and Marty was a successful lawyer, but also a marvelous chef who had mastered the art of French cooking. Ruth, her family, had mastered the art of burnt pot roast. <laughs> Ruth became a well-known lawyer, so well-known that President Jimmy Carter chose her to be a judge in Washington, D.C. Then Ruth became known as a first-rate judge, and President Bill Clinton asked her to be the justice on the Supreme Court, along with eight other Supreme Court justices. 
Her job would be to decide the most significant cases and answer the most difficult legal questions in the United States. Ruth agreed. In 1993, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg became the first Jewish woman on the nation's highest court. In, case, in each case, Supreme Court considers after hearing from lawyers who argue for each side with nine justices, then not, the nine justices take a vote. The side that gets the most votes wins the case. The justices who agree write an opinion to explain the court's ruling. When Justice Ginsburg votes were winning side, she would wear a special lace collar over her robe. Many times when the Supreme Court answers, announces a decision. Justice Ginsburg disagrees. I dissent. She says, and she writes her opinion explaining why. Plus, she wears a different collar just for dissenting. I dissent. Just, just Ginsburg, said when, Ginsburg said when the court wouldn't help women or African American or immigrants who had been treated unfairly at work. I dissent. When the court rejected a law meant to protect the right of all citizens to vote, no matter what their skin color. I dissent when the court said no schools that offered African Americans a better chance to go to college. Justice Ginsburg can be very convincing. In one dissent, she explained why the court was wrong to rule against women workers who were fighting to get paid the same as men. Congress and the president agreed with her and passed a law to undo the court's ruling. Justice Ginsburg had disagreed most often with the legal views of Justice Antonin Scalia, but they didn't just complain. I dissent. No, I dissent. They shared conflicting ideas. Each pointed out weakness with others' arguments. After opinions were written, the two justices had fun with each other. They didn't let their disagreements about law get into the way of a very long friendship. They went parasailing in France. She was riding it. They rode an elephant in India. Justice Ginsburg is, Ginsburg is now the oldest Supreme Court um, member of the Supreme Court. Some people have said she could quit because of her age. Justice Ginsburg begins begs to differ. She works hard as ever. She exercises in the gym. She never misses a day in court. She attends the opera, gives speeches, and travels. Many have cheered Justice Ginsburg for her persistence and independence. They've called her a rock star, a queen, a goddess, a hero. Of course, Ruth Bader Ginsburg isn't a rock star, a queen, or a goddess. But to many, she is a hero. She made change happen, and she changed minds. She cleared a path for people to follow in her footstep. Girls in college, women in law school, and everyone who wants to be treated without prejudice. Her voice may not carry a tune, but it sings out for equality step by step. She has made a difference. One disagreement after another. And that is the end. Great book about a wonderful woman, a historical woman. Unfortunately, she has passed away, but her memory will live on for many generations. Okay, you ready for our riddle? What does a judge put in her drink? Justice. Get it? Just ice? Because if you spell just ice, it spells justice. Silly. I miss you. I love you. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye, boys and girls.